is a lot of young guys in particular approach me because based on the questions I'm getting, they're, they're watching a lot of really intense pornography. I think uh, pornography is a serious issue. But it took me a long time to get off of that because it was quite literally, I was addicted to that. We have to take a step back and now knowing what we know about testosterone and dopamine and all these things and, and ask, you know, what it, what is pornography doing to the brain? Dr. Huberman encourages us to break free from the chains of pornography, allowing us to regain control over our minds. It's essential to be patient and persistent in rewiring our very brains, as change won't happen overnight. By watching this video, we've taken the first crucial step towards breaking harmful patterns. Remember, our minds are powerful tools, and with determination and dedication, we can overcome addiction and live healthier, more fulfilling lives. And that has, we know, you know pornography it creates a strong dopamine rush that in some ways can overwhelm the dopamine system. So a lot of young guys are getting all this arousal from watching other people have sex. And then they're in the real world scenario and it's like, wait, you're no longer third personing this, you're, in, you're actually in this scene. <laughs> and, they, and it's completely collapsing them. It also makes sense why, for instance, after a big win, sometimes we feel a crash and we need some time to reset and that lower depression, sometimes people make the mistake of going out and pursuing more dopamine. And you know, nowadays you hear, especially in Silicon Valley, about dopamine fasting. You know, the people, I don't even wanna look at somebody else's face. I'm not gonna eat any, you know, tasty food. I'm not gonna do anything that stimulates dopamine. Sure, that will reset what you find pleasurable, but let's be realistic. The better way to do things would be to modulate dopamine release, control it, make it work for you. Mm -hmm. But everyone needs to learn how they feel both before, during, and after a behavior. The period immediately after that will involve a mirror symmetric decrease in dopamine. You don't go back down to baseline, you go below baseline. So we all should guard our dopamine peaks very carefully. A little bit goes a long way, a lot goes even further, but it also takes you down deeper afterwards. This is the basis of addiction. So the, the dip afterwards is actually associated with a molecule called dynorphin, which is the opposite of endorphin and involves pain in the body. So for every bit of pleasure that we get from pursuit and getting the thing that we were pursuing, the crash that comes afterwards feels painful. And all that we need to do in order to return to a baseline of dopamine, renew that resource, is to wait and make sure that we don't try and trigger yet more dopamine in that time. Actually, you can tell if somebody has a lot of dopamine and adrenaline in their system just by looking at them, their pupils are big. So somewhat paradoxically, when pupils are big, your visual aperture is narrow. That just has to do with the, uh, with the so-called accommodation of the eye, the optics of the eye. So remember, big pupils means somebody is high on their own dopamine and adrenaline. Could be drug-induced, could be situational, et cetera. Small pupils are going to be a relaxed state. But when you can see somebody wide-eyed, mm -hmm. well, dopamine and adrenaline also do something else. They actually trigger activation of the brainstem cranial nuclei that cause opening of the eyelids. But if we start stacking behaviors, plus pharmacology, plus you know, mindsets that increase dopamine, great. But what that means is that if you get a really big dopamine increase, well, then that afternoon, you might not feel the drive to do the work. You might think, oh, why am I sleeping in the afternoon? Why am I kind of less motivated? But for most people who just need to get more movement or trying to maximize focus and productivity throughout the day, early day training is going to be probably the better option. But bet, some time is better than no time. But if you're training late in the day and you're getting a big increase in body temperature and you're doing it under bright lights and you're drinking a pre-workout, and you're wondering why you can't sleep at night, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you don't have to be Sigmund Freud or a neuroscientist to understand that you're basically just have your body, you're cranking your body temperature up. Dopamine, a key component of our brain chemistry can greatly impact our motivation. When we constantly seek dopamine spikes, it can lead to a decrease in our drive and even create a dark cycle. However, by managing our dopamine levels and incorporating healthy habits into our lives, we can experience a transformative change. So let's take control of our brain chemistry, embrace moderation, and harness the power within us to create a brighter, more motivated future. Also, dopamine seeking is what triggers the increase in testosterone, but as we just talked about it, with repeated dopamine seeking or triggering of dopamine release, it starts getting diminished, 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 so pretty soon that behavior is not causing the release of testosterone. Now people are just doing it compulsively to try and get some little droplet of dopamine out of their out of their brain. It should come as no surprise that a lot of these people have trouble with romantic interactions 
when they do happen, right? Because they, their brain isn't conditioned to respond to those. Um, it's also anxiety-less compared to dating and relationships where people are vulnerable on both sides and have to negotiate things like, you know, consent and timing and, you know, and communication and all the things that are really hard to do, but are essential to do, that's, that's key. You ever notice that when you get on a phone and you're scrolling Instagram, it's like a lot of fun. Like this stuff is cool. You're seeing people. And then sometimes you're on there and like, this doesn't feel good, but I'm doing it anyway. Yeah. I'm just doing it. That's exactly how people talk about their drug use. That's exactly how people talk about alcohol use. That's exactly how people talk about gambling. You imagine this high, but the high doesn't show up and that's you, you're dopamine depleted. You need to take some time away from it and then come back and then you can enjoy it again. Mm -hmm. And you think about what porn and masturbation, these things are, really are. I'm not calling them sinful. What I'm saying is they are potentially addictive, especially with the availability of pornography. I think given this uh, general theme that relationships are healthy, friendships are healthy, romantic relationships are healthy, and anything that inhibits the pursuit and functioning of, of healthy relationships is where you have to start saying, wait a second, I, is this behavior getting in the way? We just have to be careful. Anytime we are overwhelmed with powerful images of increasing intensity, that's where you start getting into the dopamine depletion. Mm -hmm. That's where you start getting into the hormone depletion that, that, we're, that we're talking about here. So there's also true of violence. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, they're like excited about watching zombie apocalypse violence, plus all of that violent sex and everything getting poured into the same film. Well, they made horror movies, you know, 50 years ago. They were a little bit different. The question is how strong were we driving the system? If anyone out there is feeling underwhelmed and kind of like life is no good, et cetera, chances are your dopamine system has been pushed too hard. Um, so you have, if you want to continue to enjoy things and pursue things, you have to know when to slam the gate shut. And I think that no one told us that we needed to do that. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. And so just like with training, you get out past 75 minutes, 90 minutes. If you're natural, you're going to start seeing a depletion in testosterone. Get out of the gym. Go eat, go recover, go go relax, yeah. you know? Understand what you're doing. It's like your pre-workout. One scoop the first time, you feel like you can jump over a building. Two scoops the next time, yeah, yeah. Pretty soon you're taking four scoops of that, four espressos, and you're kind of sitting in the parking lot texting on your phone. Mm -hmm. Well, what's going on? Well, your dopamine depleted. So don't dopamine deplete, and then you won't deplete your ability to go increase testosterone. So competition, effort, short intense workouts, short-ish intense workouts, sleep. So, you know, the, the body is informing the mind whether or not there's abundance. And the brain and the body like to coordinate all the good stuff that testosterone does, like the desire to mate, the desire to work when there's abundance. When you're depleted, it's like bank account is drained and your body and brain are smart. It's saying you cannot go spend because you don't have any saving. If we are in a pretty relaxed state, or if we are happy, we generally feel like we can do what we want to do. We can maneuver through our environment. We can make choices that are reasonable, but oftentimes we're not in relaxed and happy states. That's just part of the human experience, obviously. Basically what happens is when we are at the extremes of the autonomic, what I call seesaw, of very, very alert to the point of being really stressed or panicked or concerned, or if we are very close to sleep and we're drowsy and we're exhausted. At those points along the autonomic nervous system, our thoughts become a bit like a runaway train. You know, if you're very upset, it's hard to talk yourself out of it. If you're stressed, it's hard to think yourself out of it. In fact, you can start doing all sorts of third personing and rationalization. You can call someone, you can text somebody. It's very hard to get yourself out of those states with thinking alone. If we turn to the body and certain behaviors, we are able to move ourselves along the autonomic continuum. And at that point, when we've done that successfully, and it's actually quite straightforward to do, we are able to think about things differently. We start to get a sense that the way we feel might not be the way we're gonna feel forever. And it's in those shifts that we start to realize, ah, my mind actually is not my best friend at these extremes, but there's a lot more to it. You're only getting the tip of the iceberg in those states. So that's why I say, if you can't control the mind with the mind, look to the body to control the mind.